This is the story of a journey I've just made in Africa with the help of the BBC. It's a story of a long desert journey and the search for survivors of the almost vanished and forgotten first people of Africa, the Bushmen. And although the journey was only made last year, and the search to which I've referred is only just over, the journey in one sense began a long time ago. It began far back in my time. I had a nurse who was a Bushman nurse called Clara. I really think I remember her face before I remember my mother's face because she was always with me while my mother would be away with my father on affairs of state. She was away a great deal. So very early on, Clara started telling me stories. Stories about my world, not the grown-up world. Stories about insects that human beings would ignore and trample on. And so she was the sort of link and the interpreter of all the natural world. There's nothing she didn't have a story about. I remember coming one evening in the central Kalahari desert here to a pan. Our pan is an Afrikaans name for a dried up depression in the Kalahari Desert. And I remember the sun was going down and in this kind of rosy red light of the desert, we saw some human footprints in the dried up clay. And I could tell immediately, I remember Clara saying to me, you will know a Bushman foot from any other foot because it's so beautiful. Slim at the ankles, broadening out in front and always there, if it's not in a sandal, in a firm grip in the sand. But here it was embedded in clay. And those footprints became part of my conscience. They reminded me, in a way in which I couldn't ignore, of the fact that I had a 40-year-old pledge to fulfill. They reminded me of this pact I'd made in my childhood with the Bushmen. So when last year I got the opportunity, with the help of the BBC, of going to the Kalahari, I felt I had just had to go. On the morning of September the 3rd, we were ready to move on. And leading the procession was the Bushman and the love of Clara. It was almost as if I was following Clara's little face when I'd started out on my first expedition to try and save the Bushmen from extinction. I called Dabe, who had the eyes of an eagle, master, a wild, wild man in the grass down there. We pushed Dabe forward, still afraid the wild man might run. Dabe stepped out, hat in hand and called out the politest Bushman greeting, saying, Cham Kwankwe, good day. I saw you from afar, and I'm dying of hunger. I saw you looming up afar, and I'm dying of hunger. But now that you've come, my hunger's gone. You know, the people in the desert, they talk about the two hungers. There's a great hunger and there's a little hunger. And there's a little hunger that wants food in its belly. But the greatest hunger of all is this hunger for meaning. The great hunger which they dance and they sing and they paint and they tell stories about. And those things are the food for that hunger. The Bushmen who live in the Kalahari all the year round as our Bushmen did, can only do so if they have access to secret water. They keep this a great secret because they've learned from bitter experience that if there's water, their enemies invariably take it away from them. 
Now we followed a boat cow, his lovely sister Kung Kam, and Gao Tse, down to the place where they sipped the sands for water. As I got to know the Bushmen, I was becoming whole again. And I knew I was becoming whole again because in the same time, I found that all that was creative in me, the writer in me, joined up with this concept of natural man. And I wrote a book, a book called Venture to the Interior, which is not really about Africa as a geographical entity, but Africa as something in the mind of the human spirit. The kind of Africa Sir Thomas Brown, one of my favorite writers, mentioned when he said, we seek the wonder that we have within us in the world without. We have all Africa and its wonders within us. And I was going to begin at the beginning, the beginning in myself and the beginning of natural man. And that really was where my comeback into life started. And gradually as I did all this, the war which haunted me very much because I had a very strange war. Uh, the horrors of the internment, everything fell from me and stopped being any kind of problem. And I felt at last a kind of a free person in a free universe. When I first met this group in the central desert. Naturally, I wanted to know about their stories. I wanted to pick up where Clara had left off. I knew they were great storytellers. And I would ask them, and i say, tell me stories, and they would look at me in amazement and say, so we don't know what you mean. We don't understand. What do you mean by stories? And I soon realized that there was somewhere in this... Um, I hadn't earned the right to ask that question yet. I was asking it too soon. But one day when we were out hunting, a little apprentice hunter, you might have called it, a little boy, he found a tortoise. And my favorite hunter, mm -hmm, said to the little boy, now you take this tortoise and you take it back to your grandmother. The grandmother's teeth was bad and the tortoise was nice and soft. He said, I'm certain if you give her that, she'll tell you a lovely story tonight. So I thought, ah, the first time I'd heard about stories, I'll be there too. We sat and they were quite friendly and quite nice. Uh, but then after a while I said, Grandmother, I thought you were going to tell us a story tonight. Whereupon the old lady looked quite indignant. And she said to me, excuse me, please. I'm very deaf. I don't hear you. And all the people who were sitting around said, of course, she's quite right. She is very deaf. She can't hear you. And then at that, that, the old lady again spoke and said, you see what, you hear what they say? I am very deaf. I can't hear you. And then, of course, the secret was out. I laughed and we laughed together and I knew that this was just an excuse. And one day when the rains broke, I knew somehow I could ask the question. And I asked my hunter, I said, who was the first Bushman? Where did he come from, could you tell me? And I could see that blank look coming on his face for a moment or two. And then suddenly he said, if somebody told me his name was I wouldn't know how to say no. And then the stories came out. They trusted me. I told Jung the story. And Jung said, that's wonderful. How wonderful that the wise old lady should protect the story like that. Because he said, you know, 
So many civilizations have used their power to deprive primitive, vulnerable people of their story. And when their story is taken away from them, they lose their meaning and they could get corrupt and they cease to live. They lose the will to be an integrated society. And I say to him, well, this is what I had felt too. I'd felt very strongly. And he said to me, yes, psychologically, it's an enormous truth that every human being, through his dreams, is in communication with a story which, with which he's charged to live. And if they don't live that story for one reason or another, they become neurotic, they become alienated, and they lose the will to be complete members of the life of their time. Now here we come to one of the most interesting things about the life of the bush. I've heard all my life of the existence of a Cupid's bow, of course, as you have. But I've never seen it as a living part of a living society. In a glade bursting into flower, for the first time, I saw the Bushman's Cupid's bow. You see the woman coming, and unseen will creep close to her. shoot his arrow at her. If he hits her, Dabe continues. And provided she doesn't throw the arrow away, then you'll see a thing or two. We then saw Wu in the distance, walking to a spot where Liu Kam, returning, couldn't fail to see him. Wait, Muren, Dabe said. you now see how his food has been prepared for him. The arrow was unbroken. Moran Dabe said, she is his. We saw Mu suddenly respond in the way Bushmen for thousands of years have responded in this situation. His arms went up and, like an eagle, he went after her. I asked him over and over again, but how did it all begin? Where did it all begin? Please tell me where it all began. And I remember my little hunter, whom I was very fond of, Mu, um, who was also the musician of this little group of position. He was also a poet and a musician, and not for nothing, also the hunter. And he one day looked at me. Was really, he was trying to make me understand things. And he said to me at last, but you know, it is very difficult for us to say because there is a dream dreaming us. The Bushman was utterly dependent on nature. He didn't grow things, he didn't plant things, he didn't own things. I would say to them, if I asked you to be ready now to come with me for a journey of a thousand miles, how long would it take you? And in two minutes they packed up and we were ready. They had so little of what they owned, they were utterly dependent on nature. Oh, 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 oh. 
They call goodbye the moment when you never look back. They just touch and they look at one another. And then they turn and they walk away and they don't look back. These stories we owe to a people who have almost entirely been exterminated. There are very few of them left alive in parts of southern Africa, but the people themselves have gone. But the stories that we have have remained, and they have got an extraordinary vitality. They seem to, to work on so many levels, even for modern man. Perhaps the most important story of all that I know from the past says there was once a hunter. Once upon a time there was a hunter. In the beginning there was a hunter. And a hunter on two levels. The hunter for food for the stomach and the hunter for food for the spirit. He was very much loved by his community and he went out one day to hunt. And he came to a clearing in the wood where there was a very deep and a very wide pool. And he knelt down to drink happily, to drink at this pool. And as he knelt down, suddenly, in this pool, there was a flash uh, there was a flash of the reflection of a dazzling white bird. But it moved so fast, he looked up immediately, but already the bird had gone. But this reflection, this dazzling white flash that he saw, haunted him from then on. He could never get it out of his mind. And then he went out into the heart of Africa. He went everywhere. And he asked people, have you seen this enormous white bird that I saw? And he described it to them. And they said, oh, well, we've heard of it. Other places said, oh, yes, what a pity you didn't come here, here yesterday, because we were told it roosted in the trees nearby. But they could never show him the bird itself. And last, when he was very old, he came to a foot of a mountain. And they said, people there said, ah, you've come to the right place. You must climb this mountain. Because we believe that when you get to the top of this mountain, the white bird roosts on top. So with his last strength, slowly, day by day, he climbed the mountain. And after climbing the mountain and up and down many false summits, as all mountains have, he came at last to the real summit. And to his dismay, it was a sheer cliff which stretched up into the blue evening sky. And he knew he could never climb that. He was too old, he couldn't do. And he would have to die now without ever having seen the great white bird. And the story says, at that moment he prepared himself to die. And a voice said to him, look up. And he looked up, and from far up from the top of the mountain, a white feather came floating down. And he put out his hand, and he grasped the white feather, and it was said he died content. And when I asked the people who told me the story, but what was this white bird, what was it? And they said to me, the bird has many names, but we think it's the bird of truth. So you see, right in the beginning already, the search of the human spirit is a search for truth. There's nothing wrong in searching for happiness. But uh, we're using happiness there 
in a term as if it were the ultimate of human striving. And actually what gives I, we, are, we found in prison and I find in life, which gives far more comfort to the soul, you might be gives you the greatest happiness, is something which is greater than happiness or unhappiness, and that is meaning. Because meaning transfigures all. And once what you are living and you are doing has for you meaning, it's, uh, it is irrelevant whether you're happy or unhappy. You're content. You're not alone in your spirit. You belong.